Today's video is about a word that lots of people use in everyday language, but not so many people know what it means. We're going to try to get at the meaning of the word pressure and try to take a particle view of what it might mean and how we can use that particle view to make predictions about how gases are going to behave with regard to pressure. We're going to examine this by first of all taking a look at a fairly common phenomenon, something that you've seen happen before. I have a bottle of soda here and I'm going to take a drink with a straw. So I'm going to open up the bottle, grab my straw, nothing new here, take a drink from my straw. We're going to go back, watch this video again, stop at three critical places and think about particles. See if we can come up with an explanation for why this works. Why can you drink out of a straw? Okay, so going through this process again, I open the bottle, grab my straw, and I'm going to stop right there. Let's think about particles, where we are right now in this process. If we were to take a particle view of the end of this straw, sitting as it is above the liquid here, what we have is just the plastic tube has pierced through the air. The density of the air inside the straw and the density of the air outside the straw are the same because it's exactly the same air that was there before the straw existed. The straw just enters the field of view. Now let's go back to the video and advance to another place in the process. I'm stopping right here. I have not yet begun to drink but I now have stuck the straw into the liquid. Again, let's take a particle view to see how things are changing and not changing at this stage. So this is the particle view before the straw entered the liquid. Now that the straw has entered the liquid, not much has changed. The same air that was inside the straw before is also there. It's just trapped because there's liquid in the bottom. Now we can see the liquid. The particles are much closer together because liquids are more dense. Um, they're jostling around a little bit, but they're not moving nearly as fast as the gas particles because they don't have as much space to move around. The density of air particles inside the straw and outside the straw is the same, but those particles are now isolated from each other because the liquid closes the entrance. Let's go back to the video and advance a little bit further. So now I'm beginning to drink. Let's stop right there. As I'm drinking, what's going on at the particle level? Let's think about it. This was the particle view before I began to take a breath in to drink through the straw. Remember that the density of gas particles inside and outside the straw is about the same. But what happens when I breathe in and expand my lungs? Now the space that the air particles have to exist in gets much larger. And so they spread out a lot more because they just have a lot more room to exist in. So as a result, the density of gas particles inside the straw is now much lower than the density of gas particles outside the straw. Now here's what pressure actually is. When those particles of gas collide with the liquid, that's pressure. All those little collisions, their added up force is what pressure is. So the gas pressure now is bigger on the outside than it is on the inside because there are more particles on the outside colliding with the surface of the soda than there are on the inside. As a result, the liquid particles on the outside get pushed up the straw by the fact that there's a difference in pressure, a difference in the number of collisions that happen to the liquid on the inside and the outside in any given amount of time. So when you're drinking through a straw, you actually aren't sucking. There's no such thing as a, a suck door or a suck particle that pulls those particles up your straw. Instead, by making more room for the inside particles and decreasing their density, you are allowing the outside pressure to push the liquid up the straw. Let's take a look at another phenomenon. This one's not as common. Here I have an old-fashioned milk bottle and I have a hard-boiled egg that's been peeled sitting in the opening. You can see the opening is too small to allow the egg to fall in. But I'm going to change things. I'm taking the egg off. I've got this little strip of paper towel and it kind of rolled up and I'm going to light it on fire. And then I'm dropping this strip of paper inside the bottle. I'm going to put the egg on the opening after the fire begins to go out. And you can probably see that there's a change taking place right now. 
that egg that didn't fit through the opening now has, and it gets pushed into the bottle. Let's go back and review this video and come up with an explanation based on what we now know about pressure and particles. I'm going to stop right here. Let's think about the particles on the inside of the bottle and the particles on the outside of the bottle and how they interact with the egg. When I set that egg on the top of the bottle for the first time, I trapped inside the same exact air that was on the outside of the bottle. So on the outside of the egg, the density of air particles that are colliding with the top of the egg is about exactly the same as the density of the air particles on the bottom of the egg that are colliding with the egg. So the push up and the push down by the air particles is just about the same. Now there's also gravity pulling the egg down, but the opening is too much. It's too hard for a, of a barrier for gravity to overcome it with the air pressure balanced. Let's go back to the video and move forward in the process again. Now I'm removing the egg. Paper towel strip going. Let me match. Match on fire, my towel on fire, and I'm gonna stop right there. Let's go back to the particle view and try and think through what's happening right now. This is the view from before. Remember the density of particles on the outside and the inside of the bottle are about the same, and so the push, the pressure provided by all those collisions is about the same on the inside and the out. Now that I've removed the egg and made an opening in the top of the bottle, the other thing that I did was I added some energy to the air particles inside the bottle. I increased their temperature because of the fire. The longer arrows that you see on the inside particles now represent those particles moving faster. That's what happens, remember, when temperature is higher, the particles are moving faster. Now the particles are banging al along, hitting the inside of the bottle, and occasionally a particle will hit the opening and it can fly out. Particles on the outside can also fly in, but not nearly as many of them will because they're not moving as fast. So the net result is there's a kind of an exodus. Lots of particles of gas leave the bottle because they're just moving faster than the particles outside and they can push their way through the opening and join the particles on the outside. Let's go back to the video. The fire goes out, put my egg on the top, and the egg begins to move into the bottle. Why is it happening? Let's stop right here and think about particles. Now remember, lots of particles are leaving the bottle during the stage where I have the fire inside. What's the effect of that in the end? Now that my egg is back in place, and a bunch of gas particles have left the bottle, the density of air particles inside the bottle is now much less than the density of particles outside the bottle. So the collisions that happen on the bottom of the egg are not as many as the collisions that happen on the top of the egg from the gas particles. We would say that the pressure inside is less than the pressure on the outside. So what's happening is the outside pressure, because it's the same approximately as it was before, is now bigger than the pressure inside the bottle, which is less because there are fewer particles, and it's shoving the egg inside the bottle. Let's take a look at another kind of unexpected event. Here I have a glass, kind of a top, flat top. I'm going to pour some water in there, and I'm going to fill it as completely full as I can. I'm going to grab an index card that I have. I'm going to set it on top of the opening. Hold it in place, and then I flip it over. Now watch what happens when I take my hand away. The index card stays there. And I push down and let some bubbles of air inside. And when I do, the index card falls. Why did that happen? Again, we can probably provide an explanation by thinking about particles and how their collisions cause pressure. If we think about the particle view, the interface right where the card is blocking the opening to the glass, this is what we've got. Above the card, we have fairly dense water particles all crowded together in that liquidy way where they're, they don't have any structure, but they're compact. Underneath, we have air particles. Those air particles are flying around all over the place randomly, and some of them are going to be hitting the bottom of the card. 
there is apparently enough of them that their added up force from all those collisions is sufficient to keep that water in place. The only way I'm able to get the water to come out is if I allow some air particles to get in on the other side and begin to push down just like their partners on the outside are pushing up. So the combined force of all of these collisions, of all these little particles, must be pretty substantial if it can hold up liquid water. In fact, a guy named Evangelista Torricelli was noticing that it seemed like air pressure could push water up to his third floor apartment in pipes, which seemed like a lot of pressure. And he got an idea for how to measure pressure from that. He invented a tool called the barometer. Bar comes from a word that means pressure, and meter always means measure. So this is a pressure measurer. Specifically, it measures the pressure of the atmosphere. So here's how it works. He took a long tube, kind of like a tall, skinny test tube, and he filled it completely full of mercury. So it was completely full. He also had a small bowl of mercury, and then he put his finger over the tip of the tube, flipped it upside down so that the opening was down, and the closed end was up. Remember, it's full of mercury. And then he takes his finger away. Now, mercury's pretty heavy, and that's why he chose it. He knew that he would need to have a barometer that was really, really tall, like three stories tall, if he was going to use water. And he knew that mercury, because it was more dense, would be heavier in a smaller space. So he takes his finger away, and because the mercury is heavy, it begins to fall out of the tube. But don't forget, there's something pushing back. It's the air pressure. Let's take a particle view. If we look at the top of the tube, look at the interface where the top of the mercury column is, in the bottom of the view, we see just mercury liquid particles. Again, compact, not structured. But above it, there's nothing, because there's no air up there. Remember, this used to be full of mercury before he flipped it over. So that's just empty space. There are zero particles there. Nothing's pushing down on the mercury. The mercury in the bowl is experiencing a different phenomenon. Instead of nothing pushing down on the top, something is pushing down, and that is the particles of air that are in the normal atmosphere. Because they're pushing down, they compress or try to compress that liquid mercury that's in the bowl, but liquids don't compress very well, and so the liquid gets pushed back up the tube. So Torricelli's idea was if the atmospheric pressure went up, the pressure pushing down on his bowl of mercury would be higher, and that means it would be able to support a heavier and therefore taller tube. If the pressure on a certain day was low, that means it wouldn't be able to push as hard on the bowl, and so it wouldn't be able to support as tall of a tube. So he thought, every day, if I measure the height of this mercury column in this tube, I will have a measure of pressure. When he did this over and over again, over a long period of time, he found that on average, the height of this mercury column was about 760 millimeters of mercury. So he thought that's a good relative measure of how tall the mercury column should be. If it was bigger than 760, that probably meant something was going to happen with the weather because the pressure was high. If it was lower, that probably meant something else was going to happen with the weather because the pressure was lower. In time, the millimeter of mercury was renamed a Tor um, in honor of Evangelista Torricelli. And that 760 tor height, because that was the average at sea level over long periods of time, that came to be known as one atmosphere of pressure. It's the kind of the average pressure of an atmosphere. So 760 millimeters, or 760 tors, is one atmosphere of pressure. Here's another way to think about pressure. If you took a square on the surface of the barometer that was an inch by an inch, so this is a square inch, the force of all the collisions of the air particles from the atmosphere, on average, would add up to about 14.7 pounds. So the pound for every square inch, or pound per square inch, became another unit of pressure. It's another way of thinking about pressure. It refers to the definition of pressure in physics, which is the ratio of force to area. So 14.7 pounds over one square inch that's 14.7 pounds per square inch, or for short, PSI, for pounds per square inch. So one atmosphere of pressure is the equivalent of 14.7 pounds per square inch. Pounds per square inch is, uh, or PSI, is something that we use a lot in the United States. 
If that square was a much larger square, if it was one meter by one meter, that square meter of area would have a force of 101,325 newtons pushing down on it. Now that's a lot of force. That's like 22 tons of force. But a square meter is a lot of area too. So this ends up being a really big number. This was renamed the Pascal. So 101,325 newtons for every square meter is, the, is renamed as 101,325 Pascals, named after a famous thinker at about the time when these things were being discovered. Because this is such a large number, kilopascals are often used much more than pascals. So 101,325 pascals, or 101.325 kilopascals, or 14.7 pounds per square inch, or one atmosphere, or 760 tors, which is 760 millimeters of mercury, are all equivalent amounts of pressure. That's about the average pressure of one atmosphere. Now, if you're doing some problems with dimensional analysis, you can use the fact that these are all equivalent to each other as conversion factors when you solve problems. Now, this tool is only good for measuring atmospheric pressure. What if you wanted to measure the pressure of some gas that wasn't the atmosphere? Well, here's another related tool called the manometer. A manometer is a very simple tool. It's just a U-shaped tube that has some liquid in it. A really good manometer would have mercury in it because of its high density. If there are equal amounts of pressure on both sides, because both sides of this tube are open to the atmosphere, then the height of the column on the left-hand side and the right-hand side is exactly the same. The particle picture shows equal pressure on both sides because both are open to the exact same atmosphere. But if we hook it up to a gas that has a higher pressure than the atmospheric pressure, this is what happens. The column on the left-hand side, closest to the glass, goes down and the other side goes up. Why does that happen? Again, a particle view helps us understand this. Looking at the right-hand side, we still have the atmosphere pushing down on the column of mercury. But on the left-hand side, we now have more particles, and in this case, it looks like they're moving faster, which means more collisions, harder collisions, more overall pressure from the sum of all those collisions on the left-hand side. Because the left-hand side is being pushed on harder than the right-hand side, it goes down farther, and the right-hand side goes up proportionately. So how do we use this to measure pressure? Well, we can measure the height of that column. And we, if we measure it in millimeters, then we have tors. Now, in this particular case, the difference in height, delta H here, is because the gas is higher pressure than the atmosphere. So the pressure of the gas in this flask is equal to the atmospheric pressure plus the extra height that we see on the manometer. If we happen to hook this up to a gas that has less pressure than the atmospheric pressure, we'll see exactly the opposite phenomenon. The height of the column on the left-hand side is greater than the height on the right-hand side. And it's not hard to imagine why. If you think about particle pictures, on the right-hand side, we still have the atmosphere pushing down. On the left-hand side, we have some gas that is not providing as many collisions or not as hard of collisions. Overall, the pressure is lower on that side because of fewer or weaker particle collisions. Again, we can measure the difference in height, but in this case, the gas pressure is less than the pressure of the atmosphere by that height. So the pressure of the gas in this flask is going to be the atmospheric pressure minus the difference in height. And if we're measuring this difference in height in millimeters of mercury, and our barometer reads in millimeters of mercury, then we can just add these together and literally get the pressure of that gas. Now, a manometer is kind of messy. Mercury is a little bit dangerous to work with. If you don't use mercury, then the tools get really unwieldy. And you don't want to have to build a manometer every time you want to measure pressure. So over time, a bunch of other tools have been developed for measuring pressure. Here's one that you might have seen before. This is a tire pressure gauge. This works by attaching the tire gauge to your tire. And when the gas inside, the air inside the tire, rushes into the head of this thing, it pushes on this little stick that used to be balanced because the air pressure inside and out was the same, 
when you put it on the tire, it tells how much higher is the pressure inside the tire than the atmospheric pressure outside. How far the stick comes out is proportional to what the pressure is, and then you can just read off of that stick. An interesting thing that lots of people don't know about is when you're measuring the tire pressure in your car, say it's 35 pounds per square inch, that actually isn't the pressure inside your tire. It's 35 pounds per square inch higher than atmospheric pressure. So if we wanted to really know the pressure inside our tire, we'd have to add the atmospheric pressure to the tire pressure. People have figured out how to put a little diaphragm, a thin metal disc that stretches inside of a tube like this. And so if that diaphragm can be used to activate a little lever, it's attached to a needle, then you can have a dial pressure gauge. So you can hook this up to your tire or whatever you're trying to measure the pressure of, and that dial will tell you what the pressure is. It's a little easier to use. Eventually, some people figured out how to use electronics to measure stretch of that diaphragm. And so digital tire pressure gauges were invented that allow you to electronically figure out how much the pressure has stretched the little diaphragm and give yourself a readout. These little diaphragm-based pressure sensors can be made very small and actually pretty cheap. And so airplanes and spacecraft and things like that have these little pressure gauges all over the place that can be electronically read and their information fed into computers. In this class, we're going to do some experiments that use a pressure sensor, very much like the digital one used for tire pressure, except it plugs into some data collecting apparatus that we can use to gather the data and then analyze it as we try to figure out how pressure relates with other quantities that we can measure for gases. This video went a little bit longer than I usually like to make my videos, but there's a lot of ground to cover here. And Hopefully by looking at these three phenomenon, the drinking through a straw, egg being pushed into a bottle, and the card trick where the card stays in the bottom of the water, you can get a good feel for what pressure really is and how the particle theory of matter explains phenomena that are related to pressure. Also, you should know now how pressure is measured and the units that we use for measuring pressure. And now you're set up to use pressure as a measurement that you can put into experiments to try to get at how gases really behave.